in here. Good morning, everyone. Oh, come on. You've had plenty of time to caffeinate. Come on. Good morning. That's better. That's better. I expect that from Virginia. And it's great to be back in Virginia. Ray and I are both, he's a little bit more of a semi-Virginia native than I am. I lived here for about 15 years. We actually met in Richmond. And um, so it's, it's great to be back in, in our old stomping grounds again. What we're going to talk about today is, is to give just a little bit of, of um, uh, perspective of what it's like to grow at a small scale in uh, an organic production system. And um, just a little bit about us and our farm is uh, we are, the name of our farm is Plum Granny Farm, and we are located in the north central Piedmont area of North Carolina. We are uh, a century farm, so that means that our farm has been in production for over 100 years. North Carolina certifies those things. And um, it is my family land and, and farm that we returned back to uh, after living in, in Virginia and New Mexico and decided to come on back to North Carolina in 2009. We are certified organic. We've been certified organic since 2010. That was what we were going to do as we were planning on doing this farming endeavor is certified organic was, was a key part of what we wanted to do. So again, our farm is located in um, kind of northern Stokes County, which is right on the Virginia border. We are about a half hour from um, Winston-Salem. We are um, about two hours from Raleigh, two hours from Charlotte. So we're in a pretty good accessibility point for a lot of major urban areas. We, um, Stokes County is very interesting because we actually have a self-contained mountain range. We're not in the mountains, we're in the Piedmont, but we've got this great little mountain range that's right there. But our land is, is hilly and we've got lots of contours and um, lots of creeks and lots of woods, so we don't have that much acreage. The total size of our farm is 54 acres. We have 20 acres that are certified organic. More than half of that is, is hay fields. And um, we currently have about an acre and a half in, in berry production. Um, we also are a specialty crop farm. We, uh, in addition to the, the brambles that we grow, our major crop is garlic. We are the, actually the largest garlic farm in central North Carolina. And we also do a lot of other specialty things like baby ginger, baby turmeric, artichokes. So we're sort of a different kind, that's the brand that we've created for ourselves. is sort of a different sort of farm. And everybody always says, okay, plum granny farm. Do you grow plums? Where can I get plum? Plum jelly, you got that? And are you a granny? Neither one of those are true. Uh, a plum granny is an old-timey Southern Appalachian term for passion flower, and that's what my daddy always called them. And so we decided, since they grow wild all over our farm, absolutely everywhere, and they're so beautiful, that we decided to kind of give a tip of the hat to my dad and call our farm Plum Granny Farm. That wasn't what he called it when we had the farm. So, and, um, both. Uh, one, one personal note here, by the way, I am uh, recovering from a bit of a shoulder injury, not looking for sympathy, but just so when you see me wince, it's not because of something <laughs> she said, it's just, you know, because we get along pretty well. We do. We get along real well. So what we'll be talking about today is, um, uh, so what's organic, to get a little, little context there, uh, variety selection, and and these are hints and tips from what we see as a small organic farm retail almost exclusively. Um, and production will be the same way. You know, there's later on today, there's a, a real good talk on, um, on pest management and on disease management. We're not going to cover the waterfront, but there are a few things that we've learned that, that apply to a small farm, may not apply to a larger farm. And, um, uh, also apply to the kinds of things that we do. We are highly diversified because it balances out our labor. We don't harvest garlic at the same time that we're harvesting blackberries, for example. And so we smooth out our labor over the course of the year. Cheryl will talk about marketing uh, and uh, we'll have a little bit about resources at the end. 
So what we need to know is who's out there. I got a little bit of a picture earlier when uh, someone was asking, so how many people currently grow blackberries? But if I can see, uh, first, who's growing blackberries? Okay, and who's growing less than two acres of them? Okay, uh, who is certified organic? And who considers yourself in that vein, you're just not certified for a lot of reasons? Okay, thank you. So let's just talk about what this little green seal means. And basically the word organic is a legal term. It's not, it's not a descriptor, it's, it's kind of the big O, basically. And this is the definition that you see on the screen is what uh, the National Organic Program uses as the, of what is organic. I'm not going to read it for you, you can, can read it for yourself. But um, it's basically, I think it's really important to understand that it is a, a labeling term. Um, and the only way that you can use the term organic is if you are certified organic and you've gone through the process that it takes to, to, to become that. So um, I see lots of people that will use that this is organic. Well, if it's not certified organic, you are not allowed to use that term. That's, that's what all shook out when, when the National Organic Program was established. If we talk about what is organic agriculture and we talk about organics, it's a system. It's not, um, if you look at these, these um, bullet points here, you, you see the word system, you see the word ecological harmony, you see interdependent. That is really an important part about what organic is. It's a system, it's not a thing. So we, we just like to kind of educate folks about that. In practical terms, what organic means for us is that we've really got a lot fewer choices than someone who is managing their berry crop conventionally. And what most people think of when they think about organic, and we get this question a lot, is, well, what can you, what can you spray on something? Well, organic is, goes beyond that. Again, we are trying to create a system. It's not a matter of what you can apply to your crops alone. Um, we have, um, I've got a cousin, and I'm, since I'm back in my family area again, Ray's always said you can swing a cat in any direction to hit a Ferguson, and that's true. And I didn't like that as much when I was growing up. Now it's somewhat of a comfort. But I've got a lot of cousins around that are very interested in what we're doing, and they're starting to see the benefit of what we're doing. Because I'm in the middle of conventional tobacco, soybean uh, land is really where we are. So they were looking at us with a bit of suspicion. But, um, so, but we always are getting calls from cousins saying, hey, I got something eating my bug, you know, my plants. What do I spray on it? And can you spray anything on it that's organic? So they're starting to think. But again, it's not just a matter of being able to spray something. The important thing for an, an organic production system is that you really have to rely on things like integrated pest management much more. You have to make sure that you are preparing your soil uh, appropriately. So that's just a little bit of, of kind of the, the, the practical side of organic production. And one other thing just in terms of, of berries is that there are no particular types of organically produced berries in terms of blackberries or raspberries. We're using the same plant stock as a conventional grower is. We're just managing them in an organic system. So let's talk about um, variety selection right now. Pearson talked a little bit about this, but um, we have to um, look at some key questions here. Who are you? You know, who, what type of grower are you? Are you hoping to do primarily uh, large sale, large scale, excuse me, commercial growing? Are you a small farm? Are you a backyard grower? Or what other types of considerations? But you need to think about these things when you're looking at that vast array of varieties that are out there for us to choose from. Where are you? If you're in the mountains, you're going to have some considerations that are different from those of us in the Piedmont. And it really, really does um, make a difference as to where you are. As Dr. Salgado was talking about earlier, 
the difference between California and Arkansas in terms of production. And um, for example, Prime Gym, we started growing that uh, a few years ago. We're no longer growing that variety. But if you look at, it has good production in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, but if you look at its production values in Hope, Arkansas, they're not as good because it likes the climate in uh, Oregon a little bit more than it does in Arkansas. Another example could be, and this is in the raspberry realm, but Autumn Bliss. In the mountains of North Carolina, you can get 10,000 pounds per acre in Autumn Bliss, but in the Piedmont area, about 45 minutes from our farm, you can only get about 1,200 pounds. So your, where you are makes a big difference. Another question you need to ask is who is your consumer and what does she want? So if you want, if you want to be in the wholesale market, that's a very different set of circumstances and um, priorities for that customer than it would be for a retail customer. So for a wholesale environment, that customer is going to want to give you a lower price point. Shipping is going to be key. Consistency, both in terms of the berries and in the quantity that you're producing. At, um, for retail or for chefs, a key consideration, the primary consideration, is going to be flavor. What do these things taste like? And um, we, uh, we frequently compare at market a commercially produced berry, a grocery store berry, even a Whole Foods berry, compared to what we produce. And people are amazed. They are totally blown away at the difference in taste. And, and they will swear that I'm never going to buy another berry from a grocery store again, as long as I can get yours. So that's the, what the retail customer wants. And for a pick-your-own environment, they're going to want something that's easy to pick and also flavorful. So, and they will also take a lot less perfect berries than um, definitely a wholesaler would not take any, any sort of imperfect berries. We're often surprised what our uh, customers bring when they come to weigh in. It's like, you know, this looks like trash, a trash container almost, and they're so proud and they love every one of them but um, they will take much less perfect berry quality. So when you're looking at charts, and this is an example from the Norse catalog, but when you're looking at the charts of, of their varieties, it's, it's very helpful and there's some key words that you need to think about. The size of the berry, what kind of berry. Yeah, you've got those giant berries that truly there are, you can get like six berries in a pint container on some of these monster berries and it's like, you know, gee, do I really want to charge, you know, four fifty a, a pint for six berries? You know, but they're big things. But, but um, they taste great. So of course that's important. Firmness that really boils down to the wholesale considerations. You don't want to have that soft berry for shipping. So for us, we looked at all of these considerations. And knowing that, yes, we are a small farm with a very limited labor pool, we don't have anywhere near the, uh, the quantity of staff that AgriBerry has, but we're much smaller. We don't do any kind of mechanical harvesting. Uh, we are in, um, in Piedmont, North Carolina, so that's going to have an impact on our, uh, what we can produce. We're in Zone 7B, so um, that, that plays into what we're doing. Our customers are retail, pick your own chefs and value added, so we don't have to worry about shipping. Who cares? We want to get those dull, those dull berries are important for us because that's where the flavor is. That's the most important thing. And again, flavor, flavor, flavor is the key. Thornless for us is essential because not only for our comfort, but the comfort of our visitors that are coming to the farm. So the varieties that we chose were Washita, which is kind of an earlier for us berry. Um, it's erect, it's thornless, it's easy picking, it's got a nice flavor. It comes in before our June beetles, which is one of our major pest problems. Triple Crown is our winner. We love Triple Crown, our customers love Triple Crown. Actually, the very first um, chef sale that we had for berries, I really thought I was going to have to pick the chef owner of a restaurant up because he took one bite because he's like, blackberry, who cares? I'm like, try this. And he took a bite and he paused. And it was like he watched his eyes sort of roll back into his head. He almost swooned. It's like, 
God, this is the best berry I've ever had in my life. And he's a customer for life. As long as I can bring him those berries, he's very happy. And that's a really, really, really good seller for us. We, um, we do not do the primes because we were using some of the earlier varieties of prime. We did Prime Jim, Prime Jan, and we did the, um, the Prime Arc 45. Um, they were very difficult to pick because of the thorns. They were extremely thorny, and we laughingly called them the razor berries. But we are very anxious to try the, the um, Primark Freedom. So Dr. Salgado, you have to, you've got another customer uh, going to try that one there. Um, but the, they just didn't work for us. And you have to figure out what works in your system. So uh, again, these are considerations that you need to, um, to, to consider when you're establishing your production. So Ray's going to talk about a little bit about production. And, and uh, production will be uh, uh, spe specific to us, just like Cheryl's talking, specific to us and things that we've learned in a very small farm and a diversified farm. Now, you talk about these things, anybody could say that about any farm, and, and that's the whole point. Anybody can say this about any farm. You, you concentrate on your soil, feed your plants, and manage, uh, manage your, your weeds, pests, and diseases. Sure, no, no big surprises there. Um, we will uh, focus uh, on the things that, mm, primarily weed management, uh, the things that you're not talking about later on today. Um, we'll make a note as part of this, and, you, and you'll, you'll see here, this is what we were dealing with and uh, our early plantings. Uh, the NRCS classifies our area as highly erodible soil, uh, H-E-L. And I would absolutely agree. Also, it is historically tobacco. Um, and tobacco uh, production is every fall you take a bottom plow through, turn your soil over, and every spring you, you hill it up and you plant tobacco, and that's your cycle. And so consequently, we had no topsoil. Uh, the best that we had was some land that had been in uh, hay for about five years since it had been in tobacco. And that gave us a little bit to work with. But with the hills and with the quality of the soil, those were our biggest concerns. We did a lot of contour work um, uh, because of the time we were doing strictly bare uh, uh, cultivation. Uh, we've turned to fabric, which we'll talk about later. But consequently, we were concerned about our, um, our erosion problems, and we just went straight into the sod, and we um, uh, amended that with about six inches of compost. Uh, prior to planting, to try to build up that uh, that subsoil into something that we could work with, also adding a lot of dairy manure, and and it absolutely paid off for us. Now, what we did notice in in working with this is that um, uh, we were initially planting raspberries, and we were going to be a raspberry farm. That's what I had some experience with. That's what I loved, and that was a unique product in our area. Everybody grows blackberries was what we were thinking. Well, in order to do that, in order to manage disease, you need to eradicate wild berries uh, anywhere uh, in in our uh, anywhere in our area of our farm and such. And so, I was continually out roguing out volunteer blackberries all over the place, including where we had planted our raspberries. And after about six months of this, and continuously more and more blackberries coming up, I realized that maybe. I ought to be growing blackberries because they do so well there. And I, I had never been impressed with blackberries. I'm not from the South. Um, but Triple Crown won me over. We, we put some in, said, gee, why not? It, obviously, they can grow. And, uh, so, and I'm a blackberry grower. I, I still prefer raspberries, um, but I, I, I'm a blackberry grower. Uh, managing weeds. This is uh, a study that Kate Jennings of NC State presented at, uh, at uh, the Blackberry Raspberry Growers Association in North Carolina in 2012. And these are about primocane raspberries, but you can, so you can stretch this anywhere. And, and the reason that I'm showing this is because it is so dramatic. Uh, Weed-free means that there was a four-foot wide uh, band around the berries uh, that was kept weed free all season long. Weed free after 528, we let the weeds grow and come 528 it was clean cultivation for the rest of the season. 
after 627 means it was weedy until 627 and then weedy was nothing was ever done and if you take a look over this two year study at the size of the canes the number of canes and the yield I've always known you need to manage your weeds. I've always known in garlic, you can't grow garlic and weeds, you can grow one or the other, and in berries this is true. This is some real dramatic. Uh, so when I look as an organic grower, which has a whole lot of hand weeding uh, labor, and I look at how much time we're spending getting those out, I remember this chart and say, oh yeah, okay, so it's gonna come back to me. Um, for us, herbicides, there really isn't a good option. They're out there, you know, but there really isn't a good option. Flaming is not effective. It's effective on some things, but it's not effective on grass, and that's one of our biggest problems. Hand weeding, no matter what we do, we'll have to do some of it, but I'm really trying to get away from hand weeding. Um, so we've taken the, wo the woven landscape fabric as opposed to the annual fabric, and uh, we've found that that works very well for us. Uh, it can add some, uh, some challenges. Uh, the fertility issue is how do you get the fertilizer down there? Uh, and since the fabric is protecting the soil some from the weather, that means that if we put down some slow-release slow organic fertilizer and incorporate that in the soil under the fabric in the spring, there's less water and le uh, less uh, action going on to help break that down and move that through the soil. Um, so we use more... Um, uh, fertigation fish. Also pest challenges, the biggest one being that uh, you can have rodent issues underneath that fabric. Uh, we have a couple of ways that can help manage that. One is pulling the fabric back uh, in the off season to expose uh, the rodents uh, and also help expose the soil. Some. But this is what we have now. You see that white fabric, that's two foot wide on either side. The reason that it's like that is because we put this in after we planted. Now we know more, we've talked with some other people and we'll be using, when we replace this, what we call a zippered method, and that's in which uh, the left-hand side would look as it does, where that fabric is right up against the crown. The right-hand side would overlap the left-hand side, sufficient that all you end up with is a hole for the crown, but you still have that entire piece of fabric that you can pull back and expose the soil and uh, if necessary, make repairs to your irrigation line uh, and be able to, uh, to work some um, uh, dry material into the soil. It's white because we're, uh, we bought white fabric because of our raspberries trying to cool the roots in our environment. And we decided at the same time we'd do a trial. Some of our blackberry rows have black side up, some of them have white side up, we're seeing if that, in fact, makes a difference for blackberries who love the heat. Um, and you see that little, that, that gray thing in the middle, that, uh, that's one of our barn cats. Uh, we have, uh, I absolutely get cats. Uh, they are great rodent controls. So this is life before fabric. Uh, all those weeds uh, that have that been pulled up there and more to go, this was in the establishment year of some blackberries. And this is life with fabric. Uh, where our labor goes into picking, and the other is if you look at that fabric behind, this is uh, uh, Chris Overby, just one of the, he's a fabulous guy to have working with us. Uh, but if you look behind there, you see those berries that are lying on the ground. We find that we can have much better sanitation because we can sweep that, not literally with a broom, but it's easy to go in regularly, get all that trash, all those berries that fall to the ground, off of there, and in a pick-your-own environment, we have more people that are throwing things on the ground. This helps us keep that clean. Uh, uh, key to uh, pest management. Key to pest management. Those are the things that we have trouble with. Um, and all I'll say about for us here, because the pest management later on today, is spotted wing uh, is driving us out of primocane raspberries. Uh, just because it is just absolutely killing us. And, and our choice is, uh, as we'll talk in just a minute, not to be using um, uh, pesticides to try to control spotted wing. That happens to be our choice as opposed to a full requirement. The June beetles uh, in the lower left are our other major pest uh, because I don't know why they're called June beetles. They show up the 1st of July. 
they show up one week after Triple Crown uh, is ripe. And so our best berries uh, will have three beetles. They're just sucking the life out of the berry. Now, pick your own people, don't mind. They'll knock the beetles off and, and take the berry anyway. Go, go figure. Um, but we, we need to manage those. Japanese beetles are, we have a lot of them, but they don't seem to be as, be as much of a problem, perhaps because they go over to our grapes. <laughs> That's fine. We're not grape growers. They just, you know, Cheryl's dad put in these grapes, I don't know how many years ago, and we're tending them as a heritage thing as, as much as anything. Uh, so for managing pests, um, sanitation, this is all, carry it all out and burn it. And this is keeping it clean in the ground, as I was mentioning. Uh, monitoring and trapping, uh, and there, those are two different things. You can, you can trap to monitor. Uh, but trapping is really not effective for most things. Uh, we've seen increasing studies that say that the best thing to do with a Japanese beetle pheromone trap is put it in your neighbor's yard. Uh, we use them by taking the tops off and in the morning when the beetles are sluggish, we go through Japanese beetle patrol and we can knock, knock them in uh, and in the course of, oh, maybe half an hour, get each person get beetles like that. And that's sufficient to keep the population down for us. Uh, June bugs, we're looking for traps. Uh, we've seen, let's see, there was uh, put mason jars uh, with molasses and water buried in the ground, which was great for attracting raccoons. Uh, so we're, we're, there are all sorts of home remedies, and some of those home remedies work, and, and, but we're still looking for one on, on the June bugs. This is our chief rodent officer. Fabulous, fabulous thing to have on the farm. Uh, pesticides, there are organic pesticides, contrary to what people will think, uh, con uh, popular opinion out there. Uh, they are limited. Uh, for spotted wing, spinosad is not effective. Pyganic and azera are both pyrethrins. Azera at least has the uh, advantage that there are, you, you don't have a limitation in the number of applications you can make in the course of a year. But they're all broad spectrum. We choose not to use them. Some of that is um, uh, as a personal choice. Some of that is a marketing choice. We have folks that will drive from Charlotte to our farm to pick our berries because they believe that our berries, that we, that we do not use any pesticides on our berries. And, and they believe correctly because we don't. Uh, that's our choice. Um, we are up against some, all, some other perceptions. There is in Winston-Salem, the children's home, which is a historic orphanage. And one of the ways the children's home makes money is they grow and sell strawberries. Uh, they use the full range of pesticides. Uh, I'm not saying that's bad. What I'm saying is the people believe that they don't. It's the children's home. I think they wouldn't spray the children's berries, would they? So um, we, we work on that perception. But it is entirely, it's not entirely a marketing consideration. For us, that's a large component of it. Uh, we would not have people come up from Charlotte um, if we didn't have that kind of differentiation. So we rely a lot on timing. I said we're, we're getting out of primocane raspberries for that reason. We're still in triple crown, uh, but as we look at additional berries, we are taking uh, our prelude, which is a raspberry that produces the earliest uh, on, the, uh, on its floor canes and very late on its uh, prima canes. We actually had raspberries at market in uh, for Thanksgiving um, if we kept them uh, a little protected culture. We're trying to get outside of, um, of pests by doing that, and so we're shoving ourselves as early as possible. And Cheryl will talk about marketing. So I'm going to tread a little bit on, on some of the territory that's been covered, but I'll, I'll zip through this. Um, just going to show you just a few pictures here. Um, but in terms of our primary markets, farmers market comprises about, um, I would say, about half of our berry sales. Um, a quarter of our berry sales go to chefs and about a quarter are currently pick your own. So we are, we are trying to become, to, to move our marketing a little bit more towards 
on-farm activities. So I'll talk a bit about this. But for a farmer's market, it's important when you're, when you're doing farmer's market sales. And it's really interesting with Aberberry because their color is purple. We're the purple tint. We, are, we, we brand ourselves with purple. Uh, Ray, I think, ruse the day that I'd ever decided that purple was our color because we have to wear purple at every event or anything that we're doing with a farm. But um, that, that branding is really important. Um, bounty is also very important when you're doing direct sales for consumers. You want to have a lot of berries out there for people to see. They need to be really pretty. You need to have clear containers or have open, um, the open uh, fiber uh, containers. You also need to make sure, though, that don't have this bounty at the expense of having your berries get too hot. Um, and you want to always have a lot in the cooler so that you're putting out nice fresh berries. Nobody wants to see uh, a, a soggy, droopy looking berry. So you want to make sure that it's, it's beautiful and fresh. Um, make sure that you are giving lots of samples. That's essential. As I said earlier, we did some, we've done comparisons between grocery store berries, even Whole Foods berries, and our berries and that sells berries all the time. We never have a problem selling berries um, at all. We sell out constantly. One, maybe because our production isn't that much, but that's, that's a niche that we've, we've made. Everyone wants fruit. Um, it's also important at farmer's market to give your customers lots of options in terms of sizes. Typically, we sell in pint clamshells, but we also, in the past couple of years, have started doing what we call our chef seconds which will be a larger um, quantity, a, a pound and a half or two pounds of berries in a clamshell uh, that aren't as perfect and pretty and um, so they have a slightly lower price per pound and um, people love those for, for um, making pies or, or whatever. I mean, they're still beautiful berries and that's what our chefs buy. And then what you also need to do with social media is, is key for farmers markets. You need to let your customers out there know what's going on on your farm. What, what's going on with your berries? Are they um, budding out? Are they flowering? You know, I, I send out pictures constantly of where our berries are in the cycle. And you really want to try to build that demand through that. Instagram is great for that. I'm just starting to use Instagram and I know I'll be using it a lot this year for, for our market cycle. But um, people really enjoy that. We do a weekly email newsletter. Uh, we have nearly a thousand members that receive a, a, a newsletter from us and uh, we do at least three or four Facebook posts a week. Um, we've got about 900 uh, followers on Facebook. So people are out there, they want to hear about what we're doing. We're building that relationship with them. That also plays into our picuron. Um, this is actually a, a, a raspberry picuron, but just to, to show you the view from, from our farm, um, we use the flat waxed containers for, um, for picuron purposes. Uh, location is really important. As I mentioned earlier, we're a half hour from Winston-Salem. We're two hours from Raleigh, two hours from Charlotte. We're also near um, uh, US Highway 52, uh, so we're convenient to people. We're nine miles from one of the most heavily visited state parks in North Carolina, Hanging Rock State Park. Uh, so we get a lot of park traffic, people coming either to or from the park. We don't do pick your own every week. We only do about um, eight events a year for pick your own, and that's with raspberries, blackberries, strawberries. So um, we're selective, but we get the word out and we get some pretty good crowds coming. We want to make sure that people know that we are organic. And the, the concept of people driving for two hours because we don't spray, one of the, one of the issues for, for spray for people is the fact that even organic sprays are corn-based. And, corn -based. and we've learned from some consumers that have very severe corn allergies that that even if it's an organic spray, they can't consume it. So that's why we have, have tried to stick with the no spray program at all. Another thing with Pick Your Own is that even though people, sure, I can pick a berry, we like to walk them out to the field. Um, one of us, Ray or I, are there, 
to walk them out and really teach them how to pick that berry. You know, this is what a ripe one looks like, let's pick it. Pick them a perfect berry, give it to them, tell them to eat it and watch their expression and then, you know, let them go. But people have commented, because we really try to get a lot of feedback from our customers on their experience, and they've commented that they like that educational approach that we bring, and they also like the fact that our farm is ready for visitors. We are prepared, we have water, we have shade, we make sure it's a good experience, because that's what we're selling. We're selling the berries, yes, but we're also selling the experience of bringing a family out to a farm, in a beautiful location and letting kids run around and get berry stained faces and uh, really enjoy that opportunity. I've, I grew up going to different pick your own places and some of them look like desolate horrible places and they were um, you know and our farm experience is not that so we, we really want to to make sure that we're giving our customers a good experience. Another thing that we want to do is um, we participate, our farm is really becoming more and more of an agritourism venture uh, and, not, and beyond just our pick your own activities. We do lots of tours, we participate in tours, the photo that you saw earlier was with Carolina Farm Stewardship, their um, triad farm tour they did last June. Uh, we didn't have berries going on them, but we walked, it was just before them and we walked through them so people could get an experience and they were able to see what we had and we were able to gain new customers through that. Um, we also are um, becoming more of a destination for events. So Extension does a lot of things with our farm. Uh, we're hosting a pruning workshop this week. Um, we worked with a local synagogue because um, for Rosh Hashanah last year they were talking about um, the renewal and rebirth process and they thought what better place to do that than on a farm. They came to us, that was great. We were very excited about that. YMCA groups are starting to come to our farm. So again, agritourism can bring you customers and bring your farm and your operation to the forefront of people in your community. And, and that's what it's about. And then finally, from a marketing perspective, is we do jams. Um, they are, as um, was noted earlier, a great way to use seconds. That was how we got, we are not a jam company at all. We, we make our jams from our seconds, um, but we've gotten an incredible following for our jams. We actually now have eight varieties, uh, only one blackberry variety. But um, what it does is it works together. You've got that loyalty from your fresh product, but you've got your loyalty from, your, from the jam as well, and they work together. So I, you know, I don't have people that only like the jam and don't like the berries, you know. So they work together and that really helps market your, your product and again, bring more customers to your farm. So Ray's going to briefly touch on some resources. And uh, the resources are in your handout. Um, what, uh, what I want to point out is uh, a couple of things. One is there's a lot of information out there um, and there's a lot of bad information out there. And what we found over time is we rely most on um, the, the state universities. That's where we're going to be, get, that's where we get uh, research-based and solid information. Um, and uh, whether it's um, uh, Virginia State, Virginia Tech, uh, uh, and um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my, my mind's going out of me now. But, North Carolina State. Yeah, oh, that's right, North Carolina State. Yeah, I forgot about them. <laughs> uh, uh, and under websites, by the way, and something we want to mention uh, and, and draw you to, and that is Team Rubus, uh, which uh, in, your, in your handout uh, refers to teamrubus.blogspot. This is from uh, NC State, uh, Dr. Fernandez's organization. And um, there is a lot of really good information, uh, both on their website, but also uh, the blogs that she, that she produces. Last year, um, they had a study which was uh, uh, sent out an update every week in which for different varieties, they selected and tagged some uh, flowers and followed that development of that specific flower 
until it was ripe and we could see the development and, and the actual time. How long is it from flower to ripe fruit for these different varieties? Uh, most useful for those of us who are trying to predict ahead. And this questions or that's yes sir. Uh, drip irrigation uh, under the fabric, and that's also then how we fertigate. 